Hello, I'm Jeremy, and today I'm going to be talking about a family board game by the name of Spy Connection. This is put out by Pegasus Spiel, and uh, I have a multilingual English and German version. I believe that's being published in the U.S. sometime this summer. It's uh, designed by Brett uh, Gilbert and Matthew Dunstan, and the game is two to four players, plays in about 20 minutes maybe with two players, and maybe half an hour, maybe 40 minutes with four players. It will take a little bit more time with having more players. Uh, the game is a network build game uh, that's at the uh, family weight um, and in, in it players are going to be playing spies who have to v travel around Europe trying to uh, complete you know or, or visit various locations on tickets that they're given. The game definitely has some uh, strategy in it um, yet it has very simple rules. I'll take a few minutes to show you how it plays, come back, let you know what I think about it. Spy Connection is a game for two to four players where players are going to be controlling these uh, spy figures and tracing routes around Europe, trying to complete the, trying to reach the uh, spaces that are on their mission card. So the missions are going to show several cities, and the player in any order is going to have to visit all of these cities in order to complete the cards that they're given. At the start of the game, each player is going to take a starter card, which will have one of the locations marked in orange on it. They'll put a, one of their tokens. You'll start with 15 of these tokens in the basic game, 14 in the... Uh, the advanced game, and it actually does make quite a difference playing between those two uh, variants, um, and they will put their pawn in that city. So this player has Helsinki, they will start in Helsinki. And on your turn you're going to do one of three actions. The first action is simply that you're going to use your discs to build a route to a new city. So this player here, the red player, they are in Madrid and they have to go to Budapest, Helsinki, and Roma. So what they can do is use discs, and you'll notice there are spaces in between the cities connection, connecting the cities to essentially connect, connect a, a chain to one new city, and then they have to move their spy to that. Now, if on a future turn, for example, this player wanted to connect to Paris for some reason, they could build the, the connection from Madrid, which are already connected to, to Paris, as long as it's just going to one new city, and they could go all the way to Paris. Should, let's say, another player want to make a connection, let's say this player had already gone from London to Paris, and players could be in the same city at the same time, if this player, the brown player here, wanted to go from Paris to Madrid, they could certainly go through Monaco, but if they wanted to, they could even though the red player has a connection here, they could still make a new connection there. The trick is that they would have to place two discs onto every occupied space that is occupied by at least one other player. And let's say the yellow player wanted to make a connection using that same route later, they would still have to pay two discs even though there were two players there. It maxes out at two discs per occupied space. And then again, they would have to move to the new city. So those are essentially the movement rules at any time during your turn. Uh, you can choose to pull up discs that um, have already been placed as long as you're not breaking up your network. So the brown player could pull up this disc freely at any time if they need to use it to place onto a card to show that they've been to a city or to build a new connection to a new space. But what they couldn't do is pull up this one here because that would segregate this one from the rest of the network. They also could not remove a disc from the stack of two uh, while there is still a, a disc with one still available or still present in that city because that would be an invalid placement although they could remove these two entirely if it was at the end of their network so if they wanted to they could remove those four so obviously you generally don't want to do that because you could use the same connection to move back and forth across the map um, as long as those discs are still present whereas you can only build on up to one new city on a given turn when you're doing the placement so uh, that is essentially the placement rule. That is the bulk of the uh, game. You're essentially going to be building out to one new city, and then once you arrive in that city, you could check if any of your cards have that city on it, and if they do, you get to place a disc onto it. The other two actions that you could do on your turn are pretty simple. Uh, the first one is that you could take a card from this display. There will be four face up. You could take the bottom card for free, if you'd like, and you can have up to three cards in front of you that you're working on at the same time. I should caution you and say that uh, having three cards at once does become pretty precarious in terms of your disk management. Um, 
but you could also pick from these other three cards and they have a cost of one disc two or two discs to take and put them in front of you and what happens if you take this disc for example that costs one disc you'll immediately have to assign one disc to this space down here and you won't get this back no matter what you do until you've already you've completely completed this card and then it'll just return to your pool along with any of these three discs that you've used to show that you've been to those three locations so completing your your cards is just something that you're going to check at the end of every turn that you're gonna say okay look I'm in Paris do I have any cards with unoccupied spaces in Paris so because that check comes at the end of your turn um, you sometimes might pick up a card after you know to a city that's in your network and you have to go back to that city so if this player took this card that says Madrid on it you know these cards would slide down like in most games of this sort and then they would have to basically spend a turn even if they're not building to a new city Madrid is in their network just going back to Madrid so they could do that end of churn check and say hey I'm in Madrid I get to put this disc onto my Madrid card so those are basically the three things that you're able to do on your turn travel to a city that's already in your network and just you know use that to check your your card sometimes you'll need to do that also if you're like for example if I wanted to go back if I wanted to go to from Berlin to London and Berlin to Helsinki I might need to double back to, to make that possible depending on what discs I've pulled up. So you could travel back to a city, you could extend your network from any direction to one new city, and then travel to that new city. That second part is mandatory, so if I build into Berlin, I have to move to Berlin, even if that's not my ultimate destination. Or you could take one card. So players are just going to keep doing this one action per turn, going around, and whenever you complete a card, you, you, know, you have all your discs on it, you simply you know, turn it over, you know, or put it to the side, and then you'll get all of those discs back into your pool. That's the other way you're going to recirculate your discs. And the game will just keep going like this until one player gets, or I'm sorry, the first player gets seven completed cards, regardless of how many the other players have. And then you just simply finish out that round with the other players taking one final turn. And then whoever has the most points on their completed cards is going to be a, the winner. The only other rule, I suppose, is that some of the cards do have on them, besides the points on them, and I should note that the cards do have various uh, point totals on them, they have this plus sign. If ever you complete a card like that, you will get an additional turn. And that could be even if the game end is being triggered, you could get multiple turns by completing those cards in a row. Uh, the only other thing that I will note is that I, I, in addition to the variant where you start with 14 discs, which certainly makes it much more challenging and makes it harder to juggle three uh, discs at once, and the game rules do suggest that if you have beginner players versus um, experienced players, you could have the experienced players play with 14 discs and the beginner players play with 15, which I think would certainly um, even out the uh, challenge level is that the board is two-sided. The map is essentially the same. It's, a, you know, you could see it's much the same map, all the same cities, but you can see the costs over here. Even to take the lowest card here takes one coin or one disc, and then it becomes two and three moving upward. So that will constrain your discs um, even more. And the, the uh, rules say that you should only play this with the 15-disc uh, variant. Um, one last thing I'll mention, I don't have my discs uh, stickered, I just have them as play and win discs, but the game does come with a sticker sheet if you have colorblind issues, uh, or you just want the extra theming of having a logo on your discs, you could apply those to the uh, discs. And that is how you play Spy Connection. Okay, so that is Spy Connection. And this is a relatively simple um, route building game, yet it's one that's certainly challenging and at times certainly frustrating. Uh, there's a lot of blocking possible in this game and a lot of frugality required when you're placing your discs. Often players are going to immediately want to take three contract cards or, or location cards at the start of the game just because it seems more efficient to visit multiple, you know, complete multiple cards by visiting the same location and putting multiple discs down. But you'll quickly find that your 14 or 15 discs, depending on the variant that you're playing, are going to run out um, and be tied up and you'll be tearing up routes that you have to trace back the other way and there's a certain frustration factor possible with that and I think it takes a game to play before you understand just how conservative you need to be sometimes. And certainly, um, as you're playing with two players, this is less of an issue, but once you start playing with you know, three and four players, there's um, this inadvertent blocking that happens as players 
take a route that you had intended to take and all of a sudden it costs twice as much for you to go across that route. You're generally in this game not ever stuck. You know, the, it's well designed enough that you know, even if you have three or three cards in front of you with three locations each, uh, that's not going to take up all your discs. You're always able to tear up discs and make a move, but sometimes it feels very painful because you're essentially tearing up the entire trail behind you. Um, so I think when you're teaching this game, it might make sense to tell players, you know, I would not necessarily spend all of your discs, you know, taking the cards that seem the best if you're going to intend to work on three of them. Those discs that get tied up can really put a damper on your strategy. And I think in a 20-minute, uh, 30-minute game, which is relatively simple, having that level of strategy kind of surprised me. I, didn't exp I, I like a game, generally speaking, where you can actually make poor decisions and play poorly and you know have a little bit of repercussions for that. And the first game of that, I think everybody who was playing felt felt the pain a little bit and that's good and then when we played again um we 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 you know the game was quick enough that we just pulled the game out played again and everybody played much work more uh competently and the scores ended up very tight and i think that that's uh, something that is um worth mentioning the game really awards your efficiency and your strategic planning so that, yes there is certainly this desire you know and sometimes a player will get lucky and have two cards that they've gotten with no disc outlay that um, you know wed together, but even still, there there are unexpected situations where a player goes and veers right in front of you, and then all of a sudden you're in a bind. And I think that that level of interactivity is nice, especially in something that's so you know doesn't feel mean and keeps the rules so simple. One rules question that we had, which seemed vague in the rule book, was whether or not you could, um, if you have a disc, a stack of two discs on the board, if you could just pull back one of those discs if the other player who had originally placed one disc um, is gone. And we, what we decided was that that was possible if you're the only player who's there, that you could pull back one of your discs because a single disc by itself could occupy a space. But it is kind of vague in the rule book how that's written. Um, I, I guess I should look online and see if I can get an answer to that. But otherwise, you know, this is a game that um, I think would be perfect for families. Um, box says ages ain't up, and that seems appropriate. The... Um, you know, it has a, a certain ticket to ride feel, so certainly, but it's a different enough game that I don't think that's redundant if you do already own Ticket to Ride. So if you if you like that and you like that weight of game, this is one that you um, should probably check out. I would say it's I've I've enjoyed my plays of it. Uh, these designers, um, I've been you know hot and cold on some of their games in the past, um, but this is one that I think has been well developed. It seems to have most of the rules uh, filed away that you could make this more complicated than it needs to be. It's just a very straightforward design where once you start playing it and get a sense of how to play well, um, it'll be enjoyable and um, yet still pretty challenging. And the, you know, the, the uh, race aspect does um, certainly come into play, but it's not necessarily the player because there's various point uh, totals on the cards, who has completed the most cards, or tr you know, if the first player triggers the end of the game, e even if they have extra cards versus the other players, it's not always that player who will win. So, the, you know, it's a it's a it's definitely a, a game that has basically, you know, it's a kind of a one-trick pony of a game. You're not going to have your tenth play of it be radically different than your first play of it, um, except for maybe, you know, you might be playing more competently, but it's one that, because of its uh, really short duration, plays very well. And I think that the game cost me something like 20 euros or something, so it, for uh, that price I will say that it's an actually a quite quite nice little production. So it's one that I feel you know that most people like family weight games will enjoy, and those are my thoughts on Spy Connection. Thanks for watching.